Our reading this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 to 18. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, And your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams and deep springs gushing into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, And when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. All right. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversations. I would like to pray for Nathan before he shares the word with us. Uh, Nathan is a great friend who worships at St. Peter's usually, Um, but we said, can you come and preach with us because he has good things to say and he's very interactive, which I love. So um, yes, let me pray for you, Nate. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much that Nathan has come to share the word um, with us and we pray, God, that you bless him and that our hearts are open, that we hear your word through him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thanks. Cool. All right, you guys can hear me? I think I can hear myself, great, that's cool. Hey, um, yeah, pleasure to be back here. Pleasure to be with you again this morning. Um, yeah, like to be said, my name's Nathan, um, and usually work, work, worship, worship, different, um, at St. Peter's, 
Um, but yeah, once, once was worshipping here. Um, I was the youth worker for the parish for about <coughs> four and a half years um, until just recently. But um, yeah, so anyway, great, great to be back here um, and worshipping with you guys this morning. Um, now I just want to kind of start with a bit of a recap, catch up with where we're, where we're at in our little sermon series. Our sermon series is based around ordinary time. In the church calendar, we are currently in ordinary time between the kind of the festivals, the feasts of Easter and Advent. Um, and so, so we're, we're here and we're looking at ordinary time through the lenses of Deuteronomy, Leviticus and Numbers some great books to, um, to lead us through this time. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, Deuteronomy 8, which we'll get into a little bit soon. Now, I did a bit of a dive into what is ordinary time I, when, we, when we were doing this sermon series. I had to clue myself up on what ordinary time actually was. Now, ordinary time comes from ordinary, comes from the Latin word Ordin, or, I'm not very good with Latin, ordinals, which the root word of ordinals is ordo. Now, ordo is where we get um, our, the English word order, where we get our English word order from. And so ordinary time, when I think of ordinary time, before I learned this, I was just like, that, it just sounds boring. It's ordinary, it's lifeless, it's just the same old trudging, mundane boring kind of life. But then when I read this, and I was like, no, it comes from the word order. How are we in this time ordering our life after the life of Jesus? That's what this is about. That's what the sermon series is about. How do we order our everyday life, the rhythm of our life, after the life of Jesus and the life that Jesus lived and what he did for us on the cross? And so Today we're going to learn how do we order our life after this passage, after Deuteronomy 8. Cool? So, hold on to your seats. Here we go. Deuteronomy 8. Cool. So, um, Deuteronomy 8. Here we've got Moses, and he's doing his little pep talk, um, I suppose, to the Israelites. Um, they've done their 40 years in the wilderness. They're about to go into... Um, step into the promised land. Now, I think it's really important here to remember who Moses is speaking to. Okay, so it's been 40 years. Many of the, the people that came that were slaves in Egypt and have done, been in the wilderness for 40 years have passed away. Right, so the audience that Moses is speaking to here are the kids or maybe the teenagers of that time. Right, and so maybe even some of them weren't even, even born. So this message of remembrance is, is something that they wouldn't, they might not have much memory of. Um, and I think about my kids at the moment, my, my kids are, are five and, and three, and I think back to the time in my life when I was five or three, I can't remember anything. I can remember um, the one random memory I've got is um, having chocolate cake smeared all over my face. <laughs> That's it. I, I can't really think of anything else. Right, so, so when Moses is telling this group of the, the next generation, the next generation of leaders, they're quite young. They don't remember the, the, um, yeah, what God had done, done for their ancestors or, or their, um, their mum, their dad, their grandparents. And so it's really important, this message of remembrance, and that's kind of the, the theme, I suppose, of this sermon today, is remembrance. How do, we, how do we remember? And we see, that, see it all throughout the Bible. There's this, constant, there's this constant message of remembrance. Remember what I have done for you. Remember that I led you through the wilderness. I suppose wilderness, we don't really have, um, or the, the desert, we, d we don't have a desert Really, we got the is it the Rangipo Desert on the other side of Desert Road, um, but quite different than the, the desert that um, uh, that that the Israelites walked through for those 40 years. Um, earlier this year, a lot of you know, I did a trip to Jordan and Israel, and got to go around the sites. So now I think 
we might have, we, we drove through a desert. We went down, drove down um, the south of Jordan to Petra, which is an awesome place, and, and we drove through the desert there. And it's just, it's just nothing there. There's just mountains and, and of, of, not sand, but just dirt. There's no water, there's not many trees, there's little shrubs, but one there, one there. So we just don't, here in New Zealand, we don't have a kind of a grasp of what walking in the desert in the desert is. And so this message of remembrance, remember, remember what I've done for you, um, goes along with Israelite story. Now, I, um, I am not good at science. There's a couple of science teachery kind of people in the room, so I'm going to try my best. I did, I did, I googled the science of remembering, okay? <laughs> Here we go. All I did in science in class was make spitballs and throw them to the ceiling. <laughs> all I did. I tried to do physics, but it didn't work. So here we go. Okay. Like I said, I was the youth worker for the parish, and so I've always got rope and some pens and paper. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So what happens, the science of remembering, what happens in our brain when we remember? Hopefully I even get these words right. Hayden's going to hit me up afterwards if I don't. Um, Okay, so in our brains, in our brains, we've got neurons. Yes, got it right, sweet. Okay, we've got neurons. We're off to a great start. Okay, we've got neurons, okay? Here's a neuron, and here is a neuron. Now, how we remember... When we do a new activity is what happens in our brain between our neurons is they connect with synapses. Synapses? Synapses? One of those ones. Cool. Okay. Synapses, right? So here's the synapse. Synapse? Synapse? I'm just going to... It is what it is. Synapse. There we go. Synapse. Everyone's saying different things. I don't know. Okay, so when we do an activity for the first time, sorry that's a bit low, imagine in your, in your brain there is now, these two things are now connected, these two neurons are now connected, cool. That's what happens in our brain when we do a new activity, okay, the neurons are connected. Now the more we do an activity, also should have untangled the rope before. The more we do an activity, the more stronger the synapses become. So the more and more we do it, the more we remember, the stronger the synapses become. Now, I don't know how, great science experiment right there. Beautiful, it looks so much more pretty in my head, but hey, it's rope and two pieces of wood. Cool. All right, so neurons, what happens when we do an activity for the new time? These neurons connect, and it's like a pathway in our brain. Okay, so when we come to do that activity again, we come back to these same neurons and the same synapses and the connections between them, and that we go over and over again. They get stronger and stronger. The more we do it, the more we remember the easier it becomes. What also happens, now, the word myelination, here we go. Myelin, I'm just geeking out on you a bit. Myelin, here's a piece of paper. This is gonna represent myelin. We're gonna come to this later in the the service. Myelin is a substance that coats itself around the synapses. And so what myelin does, when the connection has been myelinated, it greatly increases the speed in which the signals go between the neurons, further increasing the chance of remembrance and how your, yeah, so when you come to do the activity, it's just even quicker. Okay, so myelination usually happens um, during the development of your brain, so between childhood, early childhood, um, adolescence, kind of up to when your brain's fully developed in mid-20s, early 30s-ish, okay? So here's my myelination, 
and it goes around. You can't see that, but anyway, it's there. It's my, my synapse is now myelinated. So here's my little, uh, little drawing, my science, uh, science project. Um, should have paid more attention in science class, but that's okay. So this is what happens in our brains when we remember. So we've got this charge, um, this challenge from Moses. Remember what I have done for you. Remember what I've done in the wilderness. And this is the physiological, what's happening in the brains of the Israelites. And this is what happens in our brains as we go about our lives and we remember, remember stuff. Now, when I was 16, I'll share a bit of a memory of, of mine. When I was 16, um, I was at high school, um, and I was a part of this group of, group of friends at school, um, and it was coming up to the July school holidays, middle of the year, and it was one of the boys' birthdays. Now I was a part of the, the, I wanted to be a part of the cool kids in school, and so I tried my best to fit in, to dress like them, to talk like them. Um, I'd grown up in the church, and so there had been this constant battle in my life between choosing what I was hearing and learning about in church through the Bible and what I just so wanted. I wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be a part of the cool kids. This is a constant battle. And so I feel like I got to about the age of 16 and I thought, nah, this is it. Um, I, 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 I've done the church thing. I want to see what the other side's like. And so... Um, yeah, so these boys, it was, it was one of their birthdays. They were going up to their batch um, to, to a beach, and it, they were just going to party. They were just going to drink and do whatever else. And so I was like, sweet, this is my chance. I'm going to fit in. I'm going to belong. This is, this is it. And so two days out, getting ready to go, two days out, I get a text saying, hey, um, actually, Nathan, we don't want you to come. Heartbreak, the rejection. Um, and so I was like, oh, school holidays are coming up. This sucks. Oh, I'm just at this such a low point in my life. What am I going to do? Um, and, and part of youth group, some of the youth group were going to this camp called Extend. Now, Extend is a, it's a Baptist camp. I know we're in an Anglican church, but it was a Baptist camp. Um, and it was down in Todong at the time. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, I'm either going to just sit here in my room and just be a, a mopey, teenager and just hibernate for a couple of weeks, or I could probably actually just go with my friends from church and we'll go to this camp. Now, when I was at this camp, um, how, how they do the, the nights um, is, is kind of a youth service that the young people get up and they share testimonies and there's worship music and all this stuff, and there's always a response time. Now, in this particular response time, um, again, I was being a bit of a moody teenager, and so I was probably just kind of sitting kind of just watching everything happen in the room, um, just didn't want to engage, was just kind of looking out, trying to suss it, oh, do I, do I want to engage, do I want to, do I want to dip, my, dip my feet into this or not? So I was just sitting there, and this leader come up, came up to me and just started talking. I've never talked to this leader, didn't know his name, where he was from. To me, it was just a random person coming up and talking to me. And um, what he had done, he, he went and got the response material so usually there's some kind of um, uh, physical, something you can do, like a bit of clay to make the shape of your heart. Or I don't know, that was a dumb, excuse, um, dumb example. But the response material for this particular night was glow sticks. And it was around letting your light shine. Okay, You're, you have a light, the light of Jesus in your life. And it's about sharing that light with other people, taking your light into the darkness. And so I was sitting there, a bit moody. He comes up to me, and he, got, he went and got the response material, the, the glow stick for me. He says, here, open this up. Open the packet. And the glow, and, and he, kinda, he asked the question, he's like, what, what do you notice? And he's like, um, and I, I said, oh, the glow stick's blue. Blue is my favorite color. Um, the glow stick was already, you know how you have to break a glow stick for the, the light to come out? It was already kind of broken, so I could already see that it was blue. There was already a bit of light there. Um, and so I got it out of the packet, I said this stuff, and then I broke it, and, the, and the, the light seemed to just like, not blind, but it was so much brighter than what it was. 
And I just kind of sat there for a bit. And then he said, what do you think God's saying to you through, through this? Um, and I said, well, well, yeah, blue's my favorite color. And um, <laughs> re- really deep. <laughs> Such a teenage reflection. Blue's my favorite color. <laughs> but actually, oh, this is, this is already broken. There is Jesus. Jesus is already in my life. And there is a bit of him shining out of me. But I'm at this moment in my life where I could, I could probably squash that little bit of light and hide it away, and I can go with my mates and mates, go with my friends and party and, and do that kind of live my life that way. Or I could probably do the hard thing, the uncomfortable thing, break the glow stick and let my light shine. And this random leader that was sitting next to me said, that's it. Jesus wants to break your break your life, break your heart for what breaks his so that your light shines out for your friends to see, for everyone to see, and you're going to live your life in a way that your light shines out. It was also the camp that I met Katie, and so, you know, it was pretty good. Pretty good camp. And so, and, and this, this leader, um, I obviously then learnt his name throughout the rest of camp and got to know him, and he, he kept texting me even after camp. I was living in Auckland, he was in Wellington, um, and he would, he would send me Bible verses and encouragements a couple of times a week, just saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I'm, I'm, here's, a, here's a cool passage for you to think about. Um, he was just a really good, good, good leader. And so often... I can live my life and forget that kind of a story. That story just isn't in my head every, every day. But as I'm kind of preparing for the sermon and, and thinking about, whoa, even actually now as I'm sharing it, I'm, that's just feeling pumped and excited about, my gosh, God did that in my life. He used a random person that I didn't even know, and he spoke such truth and life to me at that moment of life, that is now probably why I'm standing here preaching for you today. Mm-hmm. If he didn't do that, if I didn't go to that camp, I wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. When I remember, I'm, I'm motiva- motivated, I want to continue, I want to keep going, I want to keep remembering, I want more of what Jesus and God has done in my life. And so I'm going give to you, give you a chance, a couple of minutes, now I know when we do these kind of things, you can just start doing your own little sermons among, among yourself. So with the people around you, people next to you, one or two people, I want you to share a memory. What do you remember? Now, this isn't, this, this isn't a... I don't want you to feel stink if you feel like you don't have a memory or a time where you felt God moved in your life. Um, I, don't, I don't want you to feel stink about that. I think there's... There is a space where God wants to do that and wants to create those moments um, of, of real power and real meaningfulness in your life. And so, um, so yeah, so does that make sense? So you're just going to jump into pairs, a couple of minutes, and just briefly share what's a moment, what's a, um, an encounter, maybe it was someone, a person, um, that you've had with, with God. Couple of minutes. Go.
All right. Sorry to sorry to break up break up the conversations. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about you, but like, like I said, like when you start to remember these things, they just they motivate you and you get excited again. Those same feelings that I had when this leader was with me started to come up and, and well up a little bit inside. And, and it, yeah, so I encourage you to keep after the service or small groups, whenever, to keep sharing these stories. And so the theme of remembrance, how do we remember? What do we do with remembrance? Now there's um, Psalms, in the book of Psalms, there's, there is Psalms of remembrance, songs um, and amazing poems and literature around how do we remember? What do we do with remembrance? And so Psalm 78, Psalm 78 is, is one of those. My people, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I probably should have started my sermon with that. Hear my teaching, listen to the words from my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old. Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide from their descendants, hide them from their descendants, sorry. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Remembrance is about sharing what has happened with the next generation. Now, I know I'm, I'm a youth worker, um, and so obviously young people have a really important place in, in my heart. Um, but I was, I was thinking about this. I, my, my parents are Christian. Um, they were growing up, they grew up in the church. Most of my grandparents are Christian. And I don't know why. Why are they Christian? Was it just because their parents were Christian and their parents were Christian? Is it, did they have a meaningful camp experience like I did when I was a teenager? I just, I just don't know. And um, I'm, I'm encouraged to... Um, to find out why my parents are Christian. But I, f I feel like we have lost the art of storytelling. We keep things to ourselves. We hold on to it. Oh, that, that's such a good memory back at that camp. But now I'm starting to think, how do I share those moments with my kids? How do I share those stories with other people? And especially the Israelites, the culture of the day was such an oral culture. There was no printing press, there was no pens and paper. How did they share their stories? They told the stories and they kept telling the stories. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we, how do we remember? How do we have a rhythm of life of, of remembrance? We jump back one Psalm, we go to Psalm 77. Um, so Psalm 77. You kept my eyes, I was starting at about verse 4, you kept my eyes from closing and I was troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my song in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promises failed for all time? He has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. 
I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. In that last uh, couple of couple of verses, there were kind of three things that jumped out to me when I was reading it. I will remember your miracles, number one. I will consider, or another translation I think has ponder, and I will meditate. So the more that we remember, the more that we do an activity or a memory, the stronger it becomes. The more, lovely that my myelination stayed on my synapses, the more we do it, the faster it becomes. This rhythm of doing it and doing it again. The Hebrew word for testimony, testimony is, a, is, is like this, is sharing a story. Sharing a story of what God has done um, in your life. Now, the, the Hebrew word is a doof. Might not pronounce that right. But again, the root of that word, the meaning of that word um, means to repeat, to do it again, to do it again till it becomes a rhythm, becomes, um, becomes embedded in what we do. Now, um, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we let remembrance be a rhythm in our life? Do we just sit there and just remember the good times? Maybe we can do that. What can we do that's going to help us in our day-to-day -day life? Now, um, went to, like I said before, went to, um, went to the Jordan and to, to Israel earlier this year. And I was in Bethlehem, I think. And I picked up a bunch of gifts for people. Um, but they were just olive wood crosses. And now one of these lives in my pocket. I won't say all the time, but um, often it lives in my pocket. And it's become a tool of remembrance for me. Often I go and search, you do the whole um, keys, wallet, watch, all that kind of stuff. But now it's keys, wallet, watch, cross. Got to remember it. But every time like, I put my hand in my pocket, I walked here this morning, it was cold, my hands were in my pocket. I was like, oh, oh it's a cross. It's, oh, I need to remember to pray. These, these little things that we can do um, that just spur us in the moment to, to um, to pray and to remember what the Lord has done. Um, I remember when I was working for the church, I would catch up with Caleb um, every couple of weeks, and he, I think he's probably preached about this before, um, but he had an alarm on his phone, so I always thought, how rude, my boss is getting a phone call or something in the middle of our meeting, but it was, it was a game of something, isn't it? Game of hours. Um, you can ask him eventually when what that means, but it was an alarm on his, on his phone that would just, he would, it would buzz, whatever, and it would remi remind him to pray. So there's these little things that you can do throughout your day that are going to keep, help you to remember what the Lord has done. Tavia, when she, when she preached in the sermon series, um, she talked about her grandfather, her grandfather always waking up in the morning and praying and reading his Bible having done that for years and years. And, and to be talked about, I tried that and it didn't, it just doesn't work. I need to, it might work for a season, but it's okay to change and find another rhythm. It's okay to change. So while this is a cool little remembrance now, cool, I remember my trip to, to Israel and to the Jordan. Um, it reminds me to pray, but this, not, this might, not always, might not always work. What I do appreciate about the, the rhythm of remembrance is it motivates us to do something. It's, it's em emotive. It's, it requires a, a bit of an act. And so I thought about the, the parable of, this feels like I'm a barrier between you guys. Anyway, there we go. Um, I thought of the story of the prodigal son. Now, the prodigal son, famous story, um, the son asks for his inheritance early, he gets all his money, and he goes and blows it all in countries afar. And he's down, he's at rock bottom, and he 
gets a job feeding the pigs. And he is so hungry that he wishes he could eat the food that he was feeding to the pigs. It was down at that low, the depths of that situation. He remembers his, the food that his father's servants had back at home and the abundance of food that they had, and he remembers that. But that memory, he does something with it. He doesn't just sit in the depths and be like, oh, I wish that could have happened. I wish I could be at my father's table right now and even just serve and wait on him. Even the scraps from his plate would be enough. He doesn't just sit there and and dwell in that. It it moves him to go and do something about it. No, I'm going to go back home. Moves him to do something. When he comes home, the father is, sees him from a distance, and he runs out. He meets him with a big hug, a big embrace. He puts a cloak on him, the ring on his finger. And it's this beautiful... The, the story then continues into a big party, a big feast. And I know I'm, I'm, not, tr- I'm not trying to um, bend the, the prodigal son story from kind of its, its original... Um, original th- um, kind of meaning, but this, I think, celebration. So remembrance is emotive. It helps us to do something with what we remember. But also that another way I think that helps us to, um, to build on these connections is to celebrate, is to, is to celebrate. And so like we are in ordinary time um, in the church calendar, The bits that aren't ordinary time are celebrations. They're feasts. And so there's Advent. We have our Advent drinks. Advent calendar in December. um, There's all these different feasts in the church calendar that, again, the same, help us to remember what God has done for us. And so how that looks, how how do we celebrate in day-to-day life? We're in... um, a little practice we, we do um, with our kids at the end of each night is what are you thankful for? Real simple. It's, it's nothing new. It's nothing, whoa, that's such a cool thing. It's just what are you thankful for? This real simple practice and seeing, I read, read a, um, a, a theologian called Henri Nouwen. Um, he says, the more you are thankful, the more you are aware of God's presence and God's grace in your life. The more you're thankful, the more you are aware of God's grace and presence in your life. And so we do this thankfulness, and Simeon often says, I can't remember, um, but takes a bit of warming up, and then he, then he remembers, oh, I'm thankful for the sun, even though it was a raining day, and I'm thankful for this food, I'm thankful for mum and dad, and it just, and then between him and Luca, we spend the next, like, I'm trying to get them into bed, come on, I want, I want some time without the kids. Um, Come on, like, I want you to get to sleep. And they just keep saying what they're thankful for, um, which is really cool. It motivates, it it causes them to do something. um, They're celebrating their day. So there's rhythms that we can do throughout our day that help us to remember what God has done, to remember what God has done in our life, what God has done in our life collectively what God's done here in this parish, what God's done here in this nation, in the, in the world. Um, and so as a bit of a, bit of a response time um, this morning, there's a bunch of pieces of paper and some pens. And now we're going to myelinate our little connections here. So the more we remember, the more we do an activity the easier it becomes. When we myelinate it, the faster those signals go. So I'm going to put, we're going to um, play a little bit of music in the background, and just we're just going to have a couple of minutes. Um, and so I want you to come grab a piece of paper, and I want you to write down, maybe it's a memory, It's a memory that you're choosing to remember, to keep remembering, to bring into your mind. Um, Maybe it's this week. Maybe it's, um, yeah, what is a memory? What is something that God has done? Maybe it's a memory of a person. 
one of my, um, I suppose, regrets is, is not hearing the stories from, from Kevin, from Kevin Terry, of, I heard briefly, that the, the nights where they would pack this church out with young people from Whanganui to hear, and some of you probably remember those. Um, why was I saying that? I just, you know, I, yeah, it's a bit of a regret, I suppose. Um, and so I want to, yeah, make, make the, um, the chance for you to remember, um, to remember what God has done. Um, so, so, yeah, we'll have a think. I'll, I'll pray. How about I pray? And then we'll put some music on, and you can come up and, and myelinate these um, things with memories of what God has done. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you have done amazing miracles in our lives, in our ancestors' lives, in our friends' lives. God, generation after generation, you have been faithful. You have done miracle after miracle after miracle. And God, if we could only remember those things, if we could live our day with those um, images and miracles in our minds, God, we would be a different people. Wanganui would be a different place. And so, God, um, in this moment, Holy Spirit, I pray that you bring to mind those times. Bring to mind the moments where you have moved, where you have encouraged us and influenced us. God, help us to remember those moments and to live our days with those moments in our hearts. Amen.